Hello, everyone. Welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Today, I'm really, really excited for this one. It's been in the works for a little while, so I've had lots of time to think about it and and, and all the things we're going to discuss and very excited for it. So today's guest is someone who I've read, I don't know how many of his books and articles and all his works and everything. Uh, Dr. Gary Sheffield, you probably know him from his First World War works. I mean, uh, Forgotten Victory just blew my mind when I first read it. So that one really, really was a good book. If you haven't read it, I suggest you do. It'll change your perceptions a lot on things, but just as a scholar is always someone I looked up to. So it's great to have him on the channel. So thanks again for coming on. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, thanks for kind introduction. Oh, well, you're, you're very, very welcome. You're. Uh, your reputation precedes you for a lot of people, and that's a in a very good way. I mean, uh, I was going to say this later, but I remember you you spoke at Laurier University. I don't remember now, twenty seventeen, maybe twenty eighteen during the uh, centenary 20, years. I think. Seventeen like and eight. Uh, it's yeah, twenty seventeen. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right for the Vimy one. Right, and and it was just yeah, that was so many people were so excited <laughs> for you to talk and get to talk to you and. Because again, like the whole buzz around the centenary and everything, just people were really excited. So it's 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 awesome that you're you're here. So I guess we'll start, and I kind of ask this question to people in different ways. But the interest Canadian military history. I mean, you're British. <laughs> I don't think that's a, a crazy claim to be making, but uh, just right. Because sometimes it, there's a there's a divide, right? We were talking about this. There's a divide. There's a gap between the two, and just wondering how you kind of got to talking or you got interested in Canadian military history? Right. Well, um, the short answer is I, I'm interested in all sorts of military history. And whenever I visit somewhere, and I've now been to Canada, I think, four or five times, I always come back with suitcases loaded with books on the local <laughs> history, normally military history. But yeah. professionally, I've been concerned with military history, at least as far as it, it sort of, you know, abuts on British military history from, from my, my, my various earliest days as, as, as a graduate student. So, for example, um, when my I did my 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 master my, my research masters in in the early eighties, it was on a British um, infantry battalion in the First World War. But two mm. companies were, were were colonials, and so you had Australians, South Africans, oh, okay. and Canadians. And at a very early stage, I, it became a, a pretty obvious to me that if you wanted to understand the British Army in the First World War, you needed to understand the Dominion components. So, primarily mm. the Australians. Canadians, New Zealanders, and um, I've I've never lost sight of that. And 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 in fact, o over the years, I've become a bit annoyed by the idea that somehow the Canadians and Australians, what have you, were completely separate from the British. Right. That's absolutely not true. I mean, uh, this is not an original thought by any means. But really, no. we've got, <laughs> what, we've got one military family with different variations. So yeah. The Canadians are different from the British and the Canadians are different from the Australians and right. so on. But there's a distinct family resemblance. And of mm -hmm. course, uh, Professor Doug Delaney at uh, RMC Kingston has written an excellent book, The, the Imperial um, Army Project, which right. basically makes this point. You've got a, a, a deliberate development over the 20th century of uh, interchangeable armies. So basically, the British, Canadians, Australians, Indians can cooperate with each other and work with each other because... Basically, they're working off the same hymn sheet. Well, right. I was gonna, I was gonna bring up uh, Doug Delaney's book because I, I reviewed it for uh, Canadian Military History Journal. Uh, anyway, yeah. but I, I spoke to him just, I think, just before it came out or just after. I can't remember. And he's like, "Think about it like Lego." <laughs> and I was like, "That's a perfect <laughs> analogy. The way that yeah. you can plug in, plug it in, right? It'll look, it'll be a different color, right? But it'll still all work together no matter what you're doing." And I was like, that is an amazing way to think about this. And I think that's that's something important. And also probably as we move forward today, that's something to keep in mind, right? Because not a lot changes between the wars, right? Yeah. I, I mean, if, 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 if you don't understand that the, the British and Dominion armies are essentially in, interchangeable, um, you're not getting the picture. Yeah, because yeah, there are differences. I mean, the Australians have got one particular shape of hat. The, the Kiwis <laughs> have got a different shape of hat and all that sort of yeah. thing. Uh, but for all the things that really matter, as opposed to surface things, these are inter inter interchangeable parts of the same army. Yeah, and I and I and I think that's 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 an important part again. Like I say, because I've ran into this issue with my own research is understanding this. Like we were just talking about that, but mm. what that actually means in terms of 
even operations or even understandings. I mean, that's kind of what we're, we're talking about an operational element today. Yeah. So, and, and that was going to kind of be my next question. Cause I know this is, and you, you mentioned this on Twitter when I first brought up that we're going to be on the channel today. Um, it's a part of a larger book. So I was wondering if you can kind of just give us some insight into what the book, if you can, <laughs> I know like publishers don't like talking about it too much before. No, no, no. I, I'm happy to have to talk about it. It's uh, it's the, the, the book is called uh, civilian armies the experience of British and Dominion soldiers, 1914 to 45. So, so it's basically comparing the two world wars, but it's, it's, it's also comparing different armies within that. And the term civilian armies is, is very deliberate because, mm -hmm. of course, in both world wars, the Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders mm -hmm. and South Africans created a, a mass army on a, on a sort of, you know, build, building on the militia or, 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 or the equivalent. And effectively, that's what the British did too, because of course the British regular army is 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 big in terms of the Dominions, but actually the vast majority of soldiers who fought in both world wars were wartime volunteers, wartime conscripts, and so the British actually fought with a civilian army as well. The difference is mm -hmm. that whereas the Dominions tended to throw up their senior commanders who, who were not regulars, uh, so right. militia or territorials or what have you, the, the British regular army really maintained a really tight grip on the army in both world wars. It was actually quite difficult if you were a, 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 a pre-war territorial or, or a wartime volunteer to reach to reach high, high rank. But actually, in terms of the experience of the ordinary soldier, you're talking about, you know, Fred from Toronto or, or yeah. Bill from London, our London, I mean, as opposed to yours, <laughs> civilian jobs and found themselves in the army and they were civilian soldiers, I think, essentially all the way through. Anyway, well, what... I'm, look, I'm looking at all sorts of aspects, I'm looking at, you know, for example, the role of officers and NCOs and training mm. and things like that. But one of the things, one of the operational chapters, the one I'm working on at the moment, is looking at the experience of amphibious warfare. Uh, hence our conversation this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's, I mean, that's great. It's something I've been interested in a uh, long time. I, I've been to Normandy. I've been to all the beaches. I've been to Dieppe. I have a family connection to Normandy. I had a relative who was killed on Juno Beach on D-Day. So this is always something I'm interested. I'm sure people have heard lots about that on the channel before. Uh, but the amphibious element to me has always been something so interesting. I, I don't, I'm trying to get better with the Navy stuff. <laughs> that wasn't my focus for many years, but I'm trying to broaden my understanding. But the, the amphibious part has always been something I've been interested in. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because I, you know, kind of came of age more or less during that Saving Private Ryan time period. Maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm just guessing. But anyway, so with that said, it's it's this element of this mix, right? Literally where the land and the water meet, I think is, is such an interesting part of the elements operations here. And, and you're looking at both world wars, which I think is a great talking point for today because, and I, I do want to kind of go chronologically if that's okay, because yep. that's often the best way to do it. But we were talking before and you've got a really good argument, I think, but Gallipoli, right? Canadians don't really know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> I got some Americans watching today. I got a faithful American uh, audience that follows me that they're great. Probably not in the American consciousness, a lot about Gallipoli. So if you could just kind of talk about, you know, that as your starting point, that would be, that would be great. Just to give a little bit of background about where this sure. might be going. Well, I, I remember that the, the, the Peter Weir Gallipoli movie, which came out in 1981-ish, Right. Something like that. Oh I seem God. to remember that the, uh, the the poster they used in America had had a slogan something like that from a place that you've never heard of, a story you'll <laughs> never forget. Which actually, <laughs> the Australians were completely gobsmacked by that because it was so big in Australian and New Zealand consciousness, and even to some extent in, in British consciousness. Okay, well, the the, the background very, very briefly is that in uh, April 1915, the uh, British Empire forces attack the Gallipoli Peninsula, which is uh, on the coast of Turkey. The idea being that if you can seize the, 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 the land, that will allow you to capture the, um, the, the batteries which dominate the Dardanelles, the, the, the seaway between the Mediterranean and ultimately towards the Black Sea, uh, and allow the ships to get through and, and to, to go for, for Constantinople, to Istanbul, to stop Turkey out of the war. It was a plan that was never going to work, in my opinion, and it was a complete disaster from beginning to end. But what I want to zoom in on today is actually the the, the, the actual experience of, of the troops landing. So basically you've got two separate areas of landing beaches. At the, at the tip of the peninsula, at Cape Helles, you have the British 29th Division landing, which are almost entirely 
um, British regular soldiers, so so pre 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 war regular soldiers plus yep. plus plus reservists, and then uh, on the um, west coast of Gallipoli, a few miles further up, Gallipoli is not a very big place. No, you have the landings of of the ANZACs, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. Uh, the Australians landing first off, the New Zealanders following uh, following them, and this, of course, is is the great Antipodean epic. But mm-hmm. well, what happens is that uh, at Cape Helles, on um, three, I think, is or four, of the, the the beaches, they, there's not much opposition, and troops get ashore without too many problems. But at two beaches, uh, the main beaches, uh, V Beach and W Beach, it's an absolute massacre. Mm-hmm. Because the Turks are simply too strong, uh, everything goes wrong with the landing. I'll say a bit more about that, 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 that in a minute. And although the British eventually do fight their way ashore, they're so tired, exhausted, so many casualties. The the entire impetus of the advance stalls, and in fact, they get a few more miles in there, and then it bogs down into trench warfare. And you know, think the Western Front at a massive disadvantage because it's a very small area, mm-hmm. it's very hot. Uh, there's very few facilities. Uh, further up the coast at Anzac, the Australians and the New Zealanders land actually a, a, against the, the the Anzac myth. They actually don't have much opposition coming ashore. I mean, there's about 100 mm. countries, but it's, it's not a huge problem. The problem comes because once they get ashore, they come inland in, in small parties because they're not typically not very well-trained troops. I mean, they're very brave, but not terribly mm. well-trained. Terribly right. well-trained. Very difficult terrain. Uh, the Turks throw in counterattacks, catches them, push them back, and in the end, they they end on end up by by clinging on uh, to a real sort of sliver of land just above Anzac Cove. And so, both at Anzac and Helles, you're condemned to trench warfare, which endures basically until they evacuate the peninsula in uh, in December and January. So that's so that, that 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 that's the big picture. Mm-hmm. Now, the, what I found. Well, what I've been looking at specifically for, for this particular chapter is what went right, well, getting the troops ashore in the first place, what went right and what went wrong. Mm. And it seems clear to me that where the where it went right is that they gained surprise or simply the, the Turks weren't there. You know, you know, so, mm. so, so, for example, at, at, at Y Beach, I mean, they didn't make anything of it, but they got ashore without too, too many problems. Mm-hmm. At V and W Beaches, we're not about large numbers of Turks. We're talking about Turks at platoon strength, yep. with with a maybe a handful of machine guns and pom poms, mainly, mainly rifles. They did enough damage to prevent an entire brigade, or like more than a brigade, Eventually, getting yeah. ashore. And um, I, I, it strikes me that the, the the key things that that went wrong is that the um, the naval gunfire support from from the warships there wasn't enough of it. It wasn't mm. heavy enough, and it, they weren't firing at the right places. Yeah, that's going to come back. <laughs> that's pretty, it's pretty big. Um, yeah. They um, talk about that again. Yeah, they 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 lack surprise, or, or or possibly surprise wasn't enough. Yeah, the planning was poor. <laughs> uh, uh, they weren't terribly well trained. They had very little specific training for amphibious warfare. Uh, and they didn't have sufficient follow-up uh, um, formation. So, for example, once the uh, right. once, they, once, they, once they got ashore, had they had fresh echelons which which could get ashore and pass through and get inland, they might have made something of it. But they didn't. I mean, they they, they had some reserves, but they got sucked into the, into the initial fighting. So, none of this actually should have come out like this because actually. The British had had a, had, a, had a doctrine for, for amphibious warfare. They had oh. come up with the um, manual for combine operations only the year before. There was some right. training in it, but simply not many people knew about it, and they didn't pay much attention to it. Mm. Uh, all of which strikes me as being completely avoidable. And and to um, spoiler alert, my my argument is that actually D Day 1944 they didn't fall for those mistakes. They actually, sorry, they, they didn't make the same mistakes. They basically understood by then what you need to do. So they they got they got the, the gun, they got the naval gunfire support right. Yeah. They had full up echelons, the planning was good, the training was good. Everything wasn't true about Gallipoli in 1915. Uh, that that that's that's really interesting. And another reason why when you told me about this amphibious idea, I just, you know, the 
the light bulbs are going off, getting all excited because, and we'll get here, but the connections to, to, you know, to overlord are don't go that far back. No one goes that far back. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's connected or it's offhand remark in books or, or what have you, but to connect Gallipoli to Normandy is I think a brilliant idea because there's so many similarities and yeah, the, the whole idea of the gunfire, which is almost the, what is the impetus for Gallipoli the campaign is so interesting because we're trying to get to the same place, but in a different mm -hmm. way. So it's, it's really interesting. And I did want to mention too, because the 29th division had the Newfoundland regiment as part of it right there also at Gallipoli. Yes. Like they, they, they join later on though. Yes. They don't, I was going to say they're not part of the initial landing, yeah. which I always find is interesting. Well, two things. I know Newfoundland's not part of Canada in 1950. I know that. I don't need anybody to tell me that. They're part of Canada now, so I include them. If you don't like it, too bad. No, no. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's just a thing I keep dealing with. But another thing that's interesting, because we were talking about this earlier, is the that they're, they're the professional army division, right? Whereas the Newfoundlanders were not, right? And, and that's an interesting thing, I think, to keep in mind, because that comes mm -hmm. back the first day of the psalm right i mean well, professional I, amateur didn't matter on that day but it's it's just something i've always thought was interesting and yeah no it is interesting uh, I, 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 before i'll come back to the new founders in a moment but just to say i i i'm i'm, I'm not claiming that the connection with gallipoli and d-day is original to me in fact i actually yeah. was involved in a television program about it about 15 years ago i don't think anybody's actually done the comparison quite the way i'm doing it though right um and, and and I should actually say that people were studying Gallipoli in the interwar period. I mean, the U.S. Marine Corps, right. for example, yeah, they were. Marines, and so did the British and what have you. Uh, we'll talk about this later, I guess, but they seem to have forgotten a lot of this by the time they came to Dieppe in 1942. Um, but back back to the back to the, to, to the new farmers. Um, they had, I think, they had quite a quite a they didn't have they didn't have, the, have the, the toughest time in in sense of 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 combat because of course they by the time they arrived that most of 29th Division's major operations were over. Yeah. But it was actually quite tough up there on um, at, at Suvla Bay. In fact, yeah. I, I last time I was at Gallipoli, um, I, I, I found some, um, I think, is, is there a, I think there is a monument there to, to the they, they just opened it. I, I don't, last I'm, time has gone out the window since COVID for me, but uh, it's yeah. a recent installation. It's, it's been along, it's the same caribou that's along the yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether I saw that or whether I saw some 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 graves, but certainly I saw something to mark that there's means. both. I mean, I because I well, that is another thing I learned with the course I taught is I thought the same thing, it's just all oh, they were there towards the end, it didn't matter that much, right? But they, they had a larger role, they took casualties, mm -hmm. they lost yeah, they people, did. but yeah, I think because the, the, the caribou monument was under construction for quite a while, so maybe you saw parts of it, but uh, but yeah, it's another part that especially the rest of Canada. Because we don't even think about Beaumont and Mel all that much, mm. but it's, them on the on the you know, Lipley Peninsula that doesn't register at all. So I think well, it's. Well, well, I I like to bring it up. Am I right saying Canada Day is on the first of July? Yes, it is. Which of course has different yeah. resonances for, for for Newfoundland because it's of the song. day in Newfoundland. You have the morning is the well, Memorial Day. It's still called mm. Memorial Day because they don't join till forty nine, and then the afternoon nighttime is the Canada day celebration. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very mixed emotional day in Newfoundland, mm -hmm. but uh, anyway, so we'll keep moving. I just like, that's an easy, uh, sorry, oh, interesting yeah. aside that I just always think about, especially for the 29th division. And oh, just, I'd also you know, say that there, actually there, there were some Canadian nurses at Gallipoli. That that's the yeah. other Canadian yeah. connection. And I think there were some individual Canadians serving with British and Australian, New Zealand units because, People just did. They went from all over the. Oh yeah. The, so there's Canadians and all over the place. Uh, who yes. was seeking our way in? <laughs> can't escape from them. But, uh, yeah, we're everywhere. Even in the Second World War, we sneak our way into places yeah. you would not expect. Uh, but anyway, so so moving forward, because we talked about the bigger picture here um, for Gallipoli, but now moving to the Canadian, I guess it's. I know it's not just Canadian, but the big one, right? Yeah. yeah. The unavoidable, the emotional, the difficult, mm. the controversial. It's it's all of those things. And mm. but I think centering it in these other operations is going to help us explain it a little bit better or understand it better, maybe is the better way to say it. Yeah. So I, I was wondering, yeah, just if you can I don't think we need the context because I think I've done that before. I've got lots of videos yeah. and they're yeah. linked below as well about everything I've talked about. DF, there's lots of great stuff out there. But moving from or if there is none, right? Moving from Gallipoli to Dieppe, does Gallipoli impact Dieppe at all in the operational level, or even I, the, the psychological of the soldiers and planners? I, I just honestly I don't know. 
Well, that will actually um, complete brain freeze. Uh, guy who wrote the Canadian uh, uh, Stacy, sorry. Yeah, TP Stacy. Girl Stacy. Really yeah. am having a, a brain freeze. Uh, at one stage, he actually said something on the lines of um, that because there had not been a major amphibious operation since Gallipoli, yeah. you needed something like Dieppe to test the concept. Right. Well, um, we can we can argue about that. But I certainly will. Um, if I just, yeah. just, just <laughs> join, join join the dots between between Gallipoli and and the Second World War. Um, yeah, please do. Something which which is often forgotten, but actually I think is really quite important, is that in 1917, um, the British are planning to launch an amphibious operation behind German lines. Right. In, in conjunction with Passion, or Third Third Battle of Eve. Yeah. It doesn't happen largely because they don't succeed in breaking out of the, the Eve salient. But even in those two years, um, clearly they've, they've learned lessons. So, for example, they developed these... Um, primitive landing craft they're going to land tanks they've, they've got devices that go over the sea walls and they're actually thinking about this stuff no. really really quite well and as i said people are thinking about this in the interwar period in the, in, mm -hmm. the, in the british military and also the u.s military there are some other amphibious operations uh in 1942 so for example the british landing mm -hmm. in madagascar in, right. in, in the spring of 42 uh, against the vichy french Again, again, which which they which which is successful, uh, which they learn some lessons. None of this seems to have been taken into account in planning Dieppe. So, no. if you think that the things I said, I think really really don't work at Gallipoli. So, it's lack of, of naval gunfire support, yep. lack of follow-on echelons, lack of decent planning, uh, and I said something else as well. I can't remember what it what it was. Um, but but uh, yeah, you, you, you find the same things at. Uh, at, at Dieppe, of course, there are no battleships, no. Um, which, which, which in a sense you can understand because they're very worried about what happens to when you get capital ships up against air power. Yeah, uh, well, in 1942, yeah. as is to be, you know, the end of 1941 with with repulse of the Prince of Wales and all they that. Yeah. Um, but in that case, if you're not having battleships, you're not having monitors. You know, these these you know yeah. ship, ships with very large guns don't don't launch, launch, launch an operation like that. Mm -hmm. So, so instead they have, I think, is is it four or six destroyers, which simply isn't enough. I think it's six, but it's it's it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's, it's a pitiful number. Yeah. Um, you then have, well, okay, if you haven't got battleships, you haven't got massive naval gunfire support, air power. You need bombers, lots of them. Yep. Bomber command aren't there. It's it's partly yep. because of inter-service rivalry. There's, there's other factors as well. You have a lot of fighters. In mm -hmm. fact, they bring on one of the, one of the, the I think, I think I'm right in saying the, the, the biggest actually fighter battle over the channel of the entire war. Yes. Uh, which actually the British lose because they get more planes shot down. But it, the, the, substituting Spitfires and Hurricanes for, for, for Wellingtons and heavy bombers simply doesn't work. Right. And so, the, so to a very large degree, like at Gallipoli, they depend on surprise. And if surprise doesn't work or, yeah. or you know, if they arrive late when day has broken or what have you yep. you're in deep trouble and of course they should have known that a through common sense b through a study of gallipoli and they and, and it, they, they simply it simply doesn't happen then you look at the, the other things going on the planning is really pathetic i was reading mm -hmm. the, uh, a comment today i think it's by jack rattenstein uh, or, or someone like that who said basically it's 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 amateur hour the planning for for, for dieppe it's it's yeah. really really poor it is. It is. I mean, there's, and again, we, we, again, like I said, Dieppe gets lots of focus in Canada. I think in some ways, rightfully so, but there's the, you know, the theory, the, again, I'll use theory, you probably won't like me saying theory, but um, of David O'Keefe's book and his yeah. work on this about the, you know, the intelligence element, you know, the pinching of the enigma, all of that. And I, and I get that. I do. I don't necessarily disagree with that as say the impetus for the raid and all of that stuff. Even if that was the, if that is the case, which it seems like it may have been, again, I'm still not quite there yet. I'm not a full believer, but that's neither here nor there because looking at the planning, it just, it just, it's, a, it's a, for some reasons, there's parts of it. Say you like, say it, again, we'll just kind of go with a little hypothetical here. Like it has to be DF because of the pinch part. Yeah. I get that. I, I can, I can go with that. Right. But the things like the things on the flanks, the ideas, the armor usage, all of this stuff, most of it makes no sense. And it, I think it's because it is combined operations, right? The whole Mountbatten yep. 
cadre, I guess you want to call it. You're Mount right. Batten I think it is my... amateur hour because a lot of them were. Well, M Mount Batten is one of my least favorite senior allied commands of the Second World War. I think yeah, me too. <laughs> um, and uh, Montgomery, of course, who is out of the picture by the time Jubilee yeah. happens, yeah. he gets away, you know, because he's not in a, not in not in the place at the time. But of course, you know, he signed off on Rutter and what have you, and so. He did. He, he can't be completely absolved of the fame, of course, of, of, of the blame. Of course, you know, um, Ham Roberts and the rest of it. So yeah. there's there's a lot of like, blame spread around. But I think the, 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 the planning is poor. Um, and follow on echelons. I mean, okay, it's a raid and not invasion. And yes, you've got the um, yeah, you, you've you've got the, res the reserve uh, reserve battalion. Sorry, the main yeah, the Fusiliers uh, of Montreal. Montreal, Montreal yeah, the Fusiliers of Montreal, indeed. They're, they're, they're there, but really, you know, just, just one battalion floating around, you know, yeah. you, you need, you know the, the, the thing should never have been, for, had never been, been launched. Either do it properly or don't do it at all, right? in, in my view. So, so I think that actually, and I, I don't know if anybody, anybody has ever ma has made, made this point before. I mean, it's, um, again, it's not terribly original, but it strikes me that at Dieppe, you get lots of the mistakes made at Gallipoli repeated with far less reason, because at least in Gallipoli you can argue right. it's the first time they've done it and, yeah. and, and they're inexperienced. That's not true by 1942. Right. I think that's a good point to make as well, because like I like I was saying earlier, I think the Second World War experience is kind of, it's bottled, right? It's, it's just, oh, it's just that war, right? And then you have, like you mentioned, Madagascar, which doesn't get talked about very much, yeah. and all the other smaller commando raids and everything, some that go really well, some that go horrible, even before Dieppe. Uh, there's all of that gets mentioned, but no one seems to want to bring that back and be like, well, hold on a second. <laughs> this has happened. Why are you doing it again? Like the reasons behind it don't even matter at that point. It's just you're doing such tiny little things that are going to add up to a bad, 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 bad day. And that's and, exactly what happens. Absolutely. And, 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 and you're, 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 you're doing it badly. Of course, the excuse that was made and they hid, hid behind uh, was that this was a was an essential rehearsal for the right. day that yeah. they dis that they discovered that they couldn't capture a port because it would be destroyed in the process? Yeah. You didn't need a something like Dieppe to discover that. You you you, yeah. you really didn't. Uh, and so and um, I remember something that influenced me a lot when I was a kid was the World at War yeah. television series which appeared in the mid seventies when I was I was my early teens then, yeah. and. Um, I think, and I remember Mountbatten appears on it, basically, oh, yes, yeah, so, you know, it's terrible, but, you know, it's utterly important, what have you. It goes unchallenged. Yep. And it goes unchallenged too often down to, down to the present day. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge respect for the various historians, David O'Keefe and others, who and Tim Cook, who in different ways have looked at Dieppe and actually yep. have told the truth about it. Yeah, um, it's, 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 yeah, sorry. I think yeah. you're right with the, with the Mountbatten angle, because I was going to say, because you mentioned something that came from came up to me was and this isn't well known here and maybe it should be but in the 60s mid 62 i think it may have when it was released the cbc or national broadcaster interviewed everybody i'm talking to everybody now batten montgomery mcnaughton Ham, they got ham roberts they literally went to the channel islands to interview him which he didn't want to talk to anybody so i don't know how they talked their way into his house uh anyway but it's available online and i just most people don't know about it like they were trying to not necessarily bring it them to task i don't think but they were just trying to understand it in a way and again you see the same thing from mount Batten. you see the world at war it's it's we learned the lessons it had to be done we we learned blah 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 and they just kind of go with it and, and i think that's you still i know people still think that today because i hear it all the time yeah, well, <laughs> and it's just it's to me it's just crazy. But if you look at it, well, another thing actually, and maybe this is something that you can maybe have some insight to, especially working on this now and being in being from Britain, is Dieppe was a popular vacation destination prior to the war and for a good number of years. How did they not know what they were coming up well, against geography wise? I, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous because uh, the fact that the of course the the uh, the Churchills, the, the tanks that got onto the beach were these large, you know, well, bigger than pebble with big stones. Yeah, actually, hold on, give me a second. I got to drop off camera, but I have one right here. First time jumping off the camera like that. <laughs> but yeah, I have, uh, there's like one of them, and then there's bigger yeah, yeah, ones. Well, well, right? like, uh, sorry. Um, and, and, and any Brits watching who have been to Brighton, you know, an incredibly yeah. Pop with a seaside resort in the south of England will be aware of, of stones like that on a beach. 
right. just trying to walk walk along it in a pair of flip flops or something is yeah, difficult. It's, yeah, it's so why, did, why, why didn't they realise that would play havoc with the, the tracks of of, of 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 the churches? I mean, this is talking about lack lack of planning, lack yeah. of foresight, thing thrown thrown together. It, um, I, one thing I will say, actually, there, there, I've, there's a, a good book came about 20 years ago, which I've actually been reading today by a guy called Will Fowler called The Commandos at Dieppe, mm. which deals with the British three and four commandos on the on the flank. Uh, number four commando, commando actually is, is actually pretty pretty effective. They, they yeah. everything, everything works there. So it's not entirely uh, a failure, but where it really matters on on right. on white, white and red beaches where the Essex Scottish and the uh, Royal Hamilton Light Infantry land, it's a disaster. I mean, I've, I've only ever ever been to to Dieppe once on a battlefield tour. I remember standing up on the Esplanade where the German machine gun was in enfilade down the beach. I thought, how could anybody survive that? It, it's yeah. just ludicrous. It's it's crazy. But anyway, we have a good question. Uh, it's going to be jumped back a little bit. I, I think it's a fair question, actually. I didn't think about is the value learned from from earlier landings which were unopposed. Especially at Iceland and well, Spitsbergen, and I know a little bit about because it, it was Canadians, but I don't know if that comes into any thinking at all, or if that even registers. I I, I don't know. Yeah, yes, 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 it does because they're feeling their way to to getting things right because there is there is this folk memory of well, more than a folk memory of of of, of Gallipoli, but things have changed uh, right. between between the two world wars. So, for example, the air environment is now absolutely critical mm. because. Um, one of the things, again, one of the things which went horribly wrong at Dieppe is that the uh, at Dieppe, Britain did not have control of the sea and it did not have control of the air. Right. At Gallipoli, they had the control control of the sea, albeit they were to lose it within a few weeks when the uh, U-boat started arriving. Right. Air didn't matter, at least not to that degree at that stage. D-Day, Normandy 1944, the Allies very definitely had control of the sea, oh, they yeah. had control of the air. Dieppe, it didn't work. And but this one of this one of the things they are learning from these op, uh, earlier operations is that you need to get the logistics right. You need to get the air component right. Mm. It's all being fed, fed, fed in. The whole combined operations setup, um, which doesn't come well out of Dieppe, but of course does much, much, much later. The lessons which feed into things like Operation Torch landing in North Africa, right. Um, Husky in Sicily, um, Salerno and Anzio. It's not just from Dieppe, but certainly that, 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 that does, does play a role. It's also from these other operations. And Madagascar, which actually is, is not, it, so they, 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 it, it is not uh, entirely without enemy resistance by any means. But nonetheless, there isn't the sort of massive resistance that, that, that you, you might you might uh, got otherwise. Right. All of these things are being fed into a general understanding of the way that amphibious operations need to be conducted. So I, I, I think in, in the run-up to D-Day, I think there's, there's a solid body, body of learning through doing, if I can put it that way. Right. We did DS, it went horribly wrong. We did Spitsbergen, it went okay. Yeah. Uh, alongside the, um, the the doctrine, which, which is in place pre-war and, and it's been built on. And of course, you've got some really quite impressive people running the show now. So, for example, mm -hmm. Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, Bertie Ramsey, who's the man who, of course, um, is in charge of the evacuation of Dunkirk. Dunkirk yeah. in He's also in charge of putting them back the, op op the other way, Operation Overlord. Uh, sorry, 1940, then op Operation Overlord in 44. Yeah, so he's, he's, got very, some... he's very much an under extremely underrated character in, in all of this absolutely and, and, and you're eisenhower who's who's he was involved in the mediterranean and and he's the uh, mm -hmm. uh allied cnc for, for for normandy so yeah. actually you, you've got a lot of experience and you're getting some decent people in place i mean yeah. in place of the mount battens of this world you're getting you know some serious players yeah yeah and i, I there's some more questions here actually yeah it's more of a, a statement but i think we touched on it a little bit but I do want to talk about just for a little bit is the idea of the, the commando operations, right? Because there's a few, some go okay. I still don't think the ones that were said to go well were that good. <laughs> like Saint Azar is, it's heavy casualties, right? So it's it, it's yeah. difficult. So I was just wondering, does that come into this? Is that something you've come across, or is that kind of on its own? Uh, well, to 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 slightly hedge my bets, I'm actually going to write <laughs> a separate chapter on on, on raiding. 
Oh, okay. Including commando raids. Also, actually looking at the use of the Royal Marines landing uh, in the Mediterranean in the First World War, including in the right. in, before the Gallipoli, so the Gallipoli, yeah. Gallipoli operation. So I haven't done my in-depth study of this yet, but my, my, my sense of it again is commando operations, they, they serve various um, tar, uh, uh, purposes, one of which is basically to, to keep resistance going, to show the British are still in the war, but also yeah. they're, lear they're, they're, they're learning stuff. They're, they're learning lessons. And clearly this is feeding in. So, for example, there's, there's a whole series of raids against the Channel Islands, against Guernsey and, uh, yes. and, and, and Jersey and Ordney and all these other places. Some of them go well. Some of them don't go uh, so, so well. But they are actually getting a lot of experience mm. in, 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 in the process. And all of this, I think, does feed into, by 1944, um, together, of course, actually, with some lessons coming through from the Pacific, albeit at one, one, one maneuver, one, 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 one remove, there is a real sense of we now know what we want to do. We know what we've got to do. Mm. Um, now you might argue they're simply going back to where they were in 1917, where they had learned the lessons from Gallipoli, <laughs> and they're updating it. But maybe you have to go through your own learning process. You can't simply look at a, a, a pre, pre previous history but but the, 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 yeah i think i think the commando and other 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 operations are feeding into this sense of competence they know what they're doing yeah and i and i that's the sense i get but again history is it changes right we, that's the point of historiography and all this is why there's new new work but it's just because the commandos are part of normandy the part of these major operations also the small ones so i just it's something that how do I say this? Not in a bad way. I don't mean this in a bad way, but they get a lot of focus because of the whole, you know, the dash. It's the commandos, right? They're just cool. Oh, absolutely. So you don't get that operational sense from it, you know? And, and, and it's very deliberate, of course, because during the, the Second World War, commando operations are being played up because they are showing Britain's doing something. Britain and the Dominions right. are, are, are doing something. Um, yeah. If you compare it to what's going on at the Eastern Front at that time, they're a drop in the, drop in the bucket. But nonetheless, there are significant in the context. And you can see why things mm. like, like San Nazaire and the Brunavar Ray Airborne rather, rather than Commandos, but why yeah. these, these, these sorts, sorts of things are being are being played up. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's just an interesting way to think about it. Because, like again, I think it can get distracted from that because it's, you know, there's lots of interesting characters that are involved. I mean, Lord Lovett is, <laughs> he's kind of this larger than life guy. Yeah. And so many, sometimes literally he was a large man, uh, but it's just like in these different ways. And I think sometimes we can get caught up in that because, and again, I'm not just, I'm not saying this in a mean way because we're on YouTube right now, but like, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's that kind of clickbaity way of doing history, right? Like, oh, the commandos, they're cool. But like, yeah. you have to think about it and how this all plays together. It's not just one or the other here. Well, absolutely right. And of course, there is quite a debate about whether plowing so much many resources into not special forces in the modern sense, but specialized forces. So commandos, right. um, paras, the chindits in Burma actually mm -hmm. was the best use of resources, because, of course, when right. the rubber hit the road again, D-Day, nor Normandy to the Baltic, what the British, and I suspect the Canadians also were running out of very quickly was bog standard infantry, you know, basically mm -hmm. boots on the ground. In fact, it's always I've got ironic that uh, 52nd Lowland Division, which was trained as, as, as a specialist mountain formation, <laughs> went into battle uh, below sea level in the Low Countries because basically you know. didn't need a mountain formation. We desperately needed another infantry infantry division, so we ended up fighting for something it really had not been trained for. Yeah, that's I think that's a great point to think about it in that sense too. The, the speciality in 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 the debates about how these things come together, and I think that we can talk about this in a, in a better way without it getting too emotional and too invested, right? Because some people they they get upset, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just make sure people not misunderstanding me. I'm not dissing the commandos. No, me neither. I, I'm not. I'm, at all. I'm simply saying you need to put the commandos into the broader context of the yep. British and and, and, and imperial war, war effort. In, in 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 the Second World War, and their arguments swings swings and roundabouts about what their contribution was. Yeah, and I and I think that's it has to be discussed. Otherwise, we're kind of I think we're doing this wrong. So, um, if we can, if if that's all you wanted to say for DEP, I do want to move to the to the big one <laughs> because yeah. we've just had some good questions. Maybe we can start with those, and then we can go from there. Actually, yeah, let's do that because they're really good questions, and I'm interested. Yeah, sure. What we may have come across here, but this is an interesting one. Um, the beach reconnaissance organizations and how that develops because I know they do do important work and just wondering if it's an independent development is it because of lessons learned is 
I'm just not too sure how that comes about. Well, again, I, I'm not going to claim ex extreme expertise in this because this, this is something I should actually say, even my amphibious stuff is still work in progress. Yeah, was, of course. I was telling Brad before we started, I'd actually work, I was actually writing on my, 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 Diet, my Diet bit only today. Right. Um, <laughs> it, it strikes me that this is a very good example of how amphibious warfare becomes specialised and it becomes professional to, mm. to, to a sense. So, you know, you've got... Um, Churchill tanks sliding around on the beach at Dieppe because it can't get over can't get over the stones. Uh, then you've got the cops, you know, with the combine combine operations politics parties going ashore on beaches in Normandy prior to D-Day, coming back with soil samples so that actually they know what sort of. Yeah, someone someone just asked a question about. I, about I was going to go there next, but you're you're, yeah, you're ahead um, of us. I like it. <laughs> yeah, and so so you, you you've you've got actually you know sort of really really detailed studies of the ground. You have got the X-Craft, midget submarines, which actually are in place uh, off of, certainly off of Sword Beach, I think off of Juno Beach as well. Um, I think so. Two days before D-Day, because of course D-Day is postponed by 24 hours, midget submarines who basically then have to surface, put up aerials uh, to provide communication as, 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 the, as the invading troops are coming in. There's all sorts of specialised, really high very well thought out uh, approaches to try and make D-Day happen. Um, right. There is an argument, actually, that they spend, by they, I, I guess, I mean I mean the British, but maybe we extend it to the, to the Americans and the uh, Canadians as well. They spend so much time worrying about how they're going to get ashore, they don't pay enough attention to what's going to happen once they're, once they're ashore. Right. Uh, otherwise, okay. I think Mark, Mark, Mark Milner's book, Stopping the Panzers on 3rd Canadian Division, was a real eye-opener for me about about that i think it's a superb book which can convince me about about the canadian canadian's role um, mm -hmm. so to go back to, to my, my 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 original point about cops and, and and beach reconnaissance parties and what have you this is something which simply isn't going on at gallipoli it's not going on at dieppe it is going on at d-day which speaks volumes about the way that planning is detailed planning is accurate now, i'm not saying everything goes right and you can you can certainly find holes and things oh, yeah. that went wrong and things they should have thought up but, but didn't so for example um i don't think they paid enough attention before the, uh, the operation is launched to what happens if the weather is bad so <laughs> you end up of course juno with with the with the tanks landing after the infantry which is not yeah. supposed to what happened yeah. at sword beach you get echelon stacked out to sea because you simply can't get ashore because they're landing on a one brigade uh, front frontage maybe they should have built more more, right. more 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 friction or more to be more aware of friction yeah. but nonetheless when you compare that to, to to jubilee in august 42 or goodness sake for, for gallipoli in april april 1915 the planning for overall, the planning for Neptune is is is, is light years ahead. Oh yeah, I, and I think that's a good way of putting it. Because yeah, maybe maybe this is a good another sort of departure point here. And you kind of brought it to me. You made me think about it is because you just mentioned Neptune, right? Which is the naval aspect. But yeah. then, well, overlords all <laughs> the overlords the overall planning. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened. I don't remember. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, talking about going inland, I think that's a really good point because I think we're seeing, in a way, a reverse Gallipoli here because I know the plan. for Like, it's burned into my brain about what they're trying to do when they get onshore. But for Normandy, I understand there's things like Khan and the whole controversy yeah. behind that. But other than just saying, hey, take Khan, <laughs> you know, there's not – seemingly it's lacking because I have done, like, digging into this and trying to understand it because I was trying to – understand differently with uh, doing a battlefield tour where somebody's watching today and, and trying to understand the different levels here it's it seems like that is lacking or it's there it's just not like you said it's not thought about in the same way right because like you said soil samples and weather yeah. patterns yeah. and all of this that they're doing for months and months and months everything they're thinking about it's like once you get in land things it's a different game here so again i'm not sure well yeah and i'm hoping your work brings some insights into this yeah well, well they the, the, the big picture is, is actually fairly clear. So, for example, uh, British 3rd Division landing at Sword Beach is supposed to take Caen yeah. on, on the evening of D-Day, which, right. which is, of course, it's, it's the major uh, city. It's, it's the communications hub in that part of Normandy. Yeah. Whether they ever thought that they were going to take Caen, I think, is, 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 is an open question. Because, actually, once they decided to land at Sword, 
Right. Uh, and because of, of, of the rocks, you're limited basically to, to one brigade frontage of beach, mm-hmm. which basically means you're feeding in one brigade at a time. Yep. And of course, because of the, 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 the weather's bad, um, there's some resistance on Saw Beach. It's it's not as tough a fight, I think, as at Juno and, and Gold, yeah. so not, not as much as Omaha. But there is a fight. There's certainly a fight, mm-hmm. which means everything is pushed behind behind schedule. Um, for whatever reason, uh, Hillman, the um, yeah. major yeah. German uh, gun emplacement just inland, isn't targeted by the prelim- preliminary bombardment. It acts as, 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 as a cork in the bottle, which basically means that th- uh, three British div are slower getting off the beach and getting past and on the way to Corn. In the end, it's the uh, second King Shropshire Light Infantry who get into to, to Labizi Wood on the outskirts of Corn. They can't get any further on D-Day, probably just as well they, they don't, because I think they yeah. would be chucked out straight away if they got in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, but, but, so it, it doesn't work on D-Day, but I think it's it's very clear what Montgomery wants wants to achieve. You capture core. Once you once you capture core, you can actually start to pivot on that. You get onto the the plane, the far side of core, yeah. and then of course, as we know, in sort of totalized and tractable, that's that's the route r- 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 to fillets. And uh, um, Mark Mark Milner's uh, argument, which I say I found convincing, is that Third Canadian Division is basically to go in in, in shore, s- massively reinforced with artillery, anti tanks, oh, yeah. most of it. They're basically there to to absorb the counterattack of the Panzers, which they know are going to happen. Uh, break the Panzers, which of course they do uh, yeah. over was it seventy two hours of very very bitter fighting. Yeah. Um, the uh, British fifty div advance in 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 from Gold Beach, which which they again it's quite a tough fight, but they, they get off of Gold Beach. Really it is. Yeah. Much of Bayer Bayer on 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 the seventh. The problem, of course, is the Americans Omaha because they have a very tough fight. They they don't have the funny armor that the British and Canadians have, with exception of the of, of the DD swimming tanks, which right. don't work for all sorts of reasons. So actually, they, there is a bit of a problem joining up the Anglo-Canadian bridgeheads with the Americans. But in the end, they, they they do it. So I think there is a big overall picture. Where I think there is something lacking, at least with the British, I don't know enough about the Canadians, though I will be looking at it, is actually um, battalion, company, platoon, what do you do once you get off the beach? Yeah. Uh, because they're so concerned. I mean, understandably so with getting off the beach, maybe they haven't got a complete grip on what they're going going, going to do next. So right. actually, it's not a huge criticism. It's entirely understandable. But nonetheless, it does mean there's a pretty steep learning curve that the British actually have to, to take undertake in Normandy. So one example of this is is the, the fact that they have to learn to cooperate with between infantry and armour really quickly. And here, yeah. this, here the, sorry, just one point. There, there's a bigger picture going on here because they have learned many of these lessons in the Mediterranean, but these lessons are not transferred effectively across to England to be applied in the forces that land in Normandy. So you, you have them by the end of the Normandy mm-hmm. campaign, they've cracked it. Arguably, they should have cracked it before they set foot 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 in France. Right, and I mean, yeah, that could be a whole other, but that could be a whole show by itself. Just that one yeah. point, but. Uh, I think I think it's I think you're right again in my understanding and seeing the ground and I'm thinking about Juno here because that is perfect tank country like you can't you can't pick a better place like it's just this flat openness right that's what it's like the tank streams right so it's it's you're right with that sense of reinforced with artillery because again I've done some digging on the armor that the Canadian armor that landed uh, on on Juno Beach at um, at Corselet and to me that part was done almost near perfect as perfect as an amphibious landing can be right because like you mentioned the dds which i have a video on the first desires who use the dds which is basically a swimming tank yeah. right they put a screen around it so i'll just explain it real quick for the for the viewers but it's a tank that can basically swim its way in i mean at the american beaches it goes horribly wrong they've launched too far and it's a disaster but at juno it works and it works very well it's just once they've moved inland they kind of run out of steam almost in a way. And I think you're right talking about that in the sense of it's not that that problem's not cracked right away. Whereas you and we've had some more questions about some people just joined late and they can yeah. check later. But things in Italy, right? You don't see that in Italy. At some places, yes, I know you do. <laughs> but with the southern advance, right, where the Canadians are involved, you you don't see this sort of they get slammed, right? They're they're moving quick. And well, it just seems like we're missing that in Normandy. It's because I mean, I mean, this this is I think is is, is a really interesting problem that you, that you see the first world war to some extent, but far more so in the second. 
exchange of lessons, ta right. the Bible's, I mean, tactical lessons between theatres okay. is not good. Right. There's, I, I, I spent 20 years working for the British military, and there's a phrase which we have, which you may well have too, is the not invented here syndrome. So you, right. you, yeah. you, you don't, you know, a lesson coming from somewhere else, you ignore it. There's also a guy whose name I've completely forgotten, but actually is a senior American officer who comes over from the Pacific uh, to, oh. to, to explain to the, to, to the US Army how the Marines and, and the Army are doing it in the Pacific. He's given a stiff ignoring because they don't, they don't, they don't care about Pacific. And so yeah. the Americans actually are, I think, are even worse than the British and the Canadians are. But, but there, there, there is a lack of read across mm. of lessons from the Med to the Anglo-Canadian forces. Um, but one, one thing, if I, if I could just, just go back, I think it's really critical. If I go back to my key things, which, which went wrong, right and wrong at Gallipoli and, and, and Dieppe, gunfire support. Yeah, I want to talk about this, yeah. But for D-Day, they actually, if anything, they, they, they over-insure. So you've got, you've got battleships, yeah. you have got uh, uh, landing craft, with rockets, oh, yeah. you have got field artillery units with with self propelled artillery simply hitting the beaches they're coming. No chance, that, yeah. no chance of any uh, aiming at, at, at anything, but nonetheless, the, the the number of bangs going off is tremendous. Now, uh, of course, what it doesn't do is actually destroy fortifications, but that's not what it's intended to do. It's intended to make the defenders keep their heads down. The same as the bombing. The bombing is not terribly accurate, but mm. I think it is effective in the sense that it it, it paralyzes the defenders at least enough for example at, at, at Juno so um, so I, I, the the Canadians landing at Juno I think have a particularly tough um, job because there there was clearly there, there's some defenders who were there and firing and, and put, putting up resistance but just imagine yeah. what it would be like if actually they had landed without that Preliminary yeah. bomb, fire, uh, bomb bombardments, preliminary gun gunfire. The 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 bombardment of the Anglo-Canadian beaches is, is not perfect. No. Neither is neither is the, the bombing, but it does enough to keep the enemy heads down and make sure that the the troops have a fighting chance to to, to get on shore. And the and the other thing I think is critical, of course, is the specialized armor. So yeah. you, you, you've got the Avrys, the armored vehicle, Royal Engineers. You know you've you've got the flail tanks and all yeah. all the rest of it. Uh, but also you've got the um, again. I'm not sure if they they use at Juno. They certainly are are are, are at sword and, and gold. The uh, the uh, the Royal Marine Armour Armour Squad is using Centaur tanks with 90 millimeter uh, mortars on them. So basically they're mm. they're there to to provide intimate close range support. They're bunker busters and that sort of thing. Yeah, right. I was doing some, some, some research on them, and they they basically they they were landed there without any support. Basically, they're there. To blast their, their help blast infantry off the beach. So once they've done that, they're taken back to England and, and they're yeah. So, but huge amount of firepower. Yeah, I don't think they have those, and and you know because they they do have the the engineering. Yeah, the, the A bars land there and they're used because there's British units landing on Juno. They use them, but I don't think those are used. Um, but yeah, sorry, I was going to say the, the the fire support. I think you make a really good point that gets lost in all of this. And I think popular culture and all that has an impact to play, but the you know the ineffectiveness supposedly of the the bombing and the um, sorry the naval gunfire, and and why I come to this again talking about the first Czars and the units that landed at that part of Juno Beach is I don't see because we already talked about this the tanks were late. I don't see how the infantry survives, let alone has any chance <laughs> without the bombardment right they talk about this in the war diaries that it helps them get on shore the tanks are late at some points they're not as late but it's it's this combination that gets them ashore and that's what they can take out like you said these defenses that are very very formidable at this point and this part of the beach and they're able to you know get through all right i'm, I'm, go I'm not going to regret going so i found a marvelous quote from a Canadian, which basically said, um, "No, I can't find it." Uh, basically, they, 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 it's from a frontline Canadian, Canadian. Yeah, I know the one you're talking about. Who, who, who says, you know, yeah, uh, know. Uh, yeah there, there was no yeah. bombardment; it was hopeless. No, there was a massive bombardment. I can quite understand if you're actually coming in on a landing craft and people are firing at you, you're thinking the bombardment is not doing its job. Right. Really, it is because if it hadn't been doing its job. 
that guy wouldn't have survived to write up his diary afterwards. Exactly. Yeah, um, it's like yeah, bombard you know, or yeah, bombardment and effective tanks late or something like that. I think it's no, the, that, 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 that's right. I think it's or, the or, or, Winnipeg or, Rifles. Yeah. Or, 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 Oh, yeah, that, that's right. That's exactly where, where the quote comes from. All, yeah. all of which is true. Uh, it's true. <laughs> well, uh, tanks are late. Bob, Bob is, isn't as effective as people would like it to have been, but it it, it, it did enough. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think is really important, I, I think, to, to take on board is that the Anglo-Canadian beaches move away from the idea of Fight, you know, the, the, the famous quote, you know, fighting, uh, fighting steel, steel with flesh, putting infantry over first. You, 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 you put the armor on first. Now, of course, it doesn't always work because they right. landed with different serials. But actually, the plan was you put the specialized armor on first, both the Avery's and 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 the and mm. the small Germans, first two Tsars in the Canadian case, uh, the fourth seventh dragoon guards in the British case. Yeah. Um, but only then. Do you do you land the infantry after the armor's got ashore first? This is a completely different way of thinking to Dieppe, and even more so. Well, of course, the armor does doesn't exist at Gallipoli, but it, it's it's it's. It, I think it's it's a very different a, approach. So you're using not fighting um, steel with flesh. You're fighting um, steel with steel. Right. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. Um, sorry, we did get an answer about the uh, where to go. I had a rush of comments there, real quick. <laughs> yeah, about the. Uh, the oh, there you go. Yeah, they did. So, so, so you do get the yeah the, the Royal Marines at Juno. Yeah, they did. Um, and then there was one other. Maybe I missed another one. Uh, oh yeah, and then they supported the airborne uh, assault, assault later. Uh, but yes, and then confirmed that it is the Winnipeg rifles. I have it saved somewhere on my. Uh, my yeah, I, I've, I've got the quote somewhere in my chapter. Uh, by the way, the, 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 there's a Centaur tank. Just down the road from Pegasus Bridge in Normandy, which confuses yeah. the hell out of people because actually, <laughs> it's not my guide or anything like that. It's simply to be there, but you know, it's it's because Pegasus is not far from Sword Beach, and, yeah. and they were certainly busted on Sword Beach. People were really upset about that one. I remember that. Um, <laughs> but what's there? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, we got. Uh, I just want to see if we have more else. Yeah, we had a question about maybe you don't. Well, I don't know. If we can maybe talk about it in the sense we we're already talking about exchange and ideas about the Marines not using DDs, uh, and then we had uh, landing in the Pacific. Uh, honestly, I, 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 I don't know. It might have yeah. been a case of, of not invented here since syndrome. Because don't forget, I mean, even Bradley and, and, and First US Army were a bit reluctant to, well, they didn't take any any funny armor, as in the, the, the Avery's. Well, yeah, we had another, yeah, the same statement. We had, yeah, Shafe has priority, oh, which is true. And yeah, there's well, the coral reefs. Yeah, hold on, we had it here. Someone yeah. else mentioned, yeah, that the, the American beaches don't have that specialized armor other than the DDs. But they like, don't. Do I, I, sorry, I, think I, I think I think I think that that's a really big mistake. I mean, it's one of the, one of the principal mistakes in the planning for for D-Day. Uh, Stephen Ambrose's book on D-Day, which came out probably thirty odd years ago, he mm -hmm. made a sort of I thought slightly snide remark that uh, the British, by which I think he also includes the Canadians. Uh, you know they're 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 big on gadgets. Well, yeah, but there's <laughs> a reason yeah. for that. Yeah, because I, I got slaughtered on the beaches of Dieppe. Yeah, <laughs> not just that. I think also I think it's the difference of strategic culture. You know, because the British and the Canadians are scarred by the Somme and Passion Vale. Yeah, too. The, Ameri the, the Americans don't go through that experience. I mean, yes, they are in actually at the very end of the First World War, but it doesn't have anything like the same impact on Canadian and British psyche. So the British and Canadians would do anything. To avoid a repeat of that, and if that means investing heavily in armor and funny tanks, go for it. That's what yeah, we're doing. Yeah, Well, that's and this is a bit of an aside, but it's connected. Is and it drives me crazy, especially because it comes from the literal losers of the war. That the German and I know why because of the whole involvement in the Cold War context and all of that. But it still drives me nuts. Is that the Germans say they didn't fight properly? And and because me and my fiance have talked about this, and she is not. She loves, likes history, but she's not a specialist in any way, shape, or form military history. But I'm like, I always say this to her because I like sport. I'm a big sports fan too. It's like I don't care how they win. I want to win. <laughs> I don't care how it's done. I don't, I don't care if the enemy or the other team doesn't like it. I want to win. I don't care. So like that's another thing I think is part of this is how we understand these things and breaking these. I, 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 I think that, 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 that that's absolutely right. There's some sort of sense that 
the Germans were better than the, the Allies, which I don't think is true. And yeah. the Allies somehow cheated yeah. by, by maximising their assets, which were air power, armour, artillery. Well, you'd be stupid not to. Yeah. Um, having said that, I, th I think that um, the, the extent to which the Germans were tactically superior to the Allies in Normandy has been much overblown. Uh, I remember meeting, well, I've met him before, but uh, Terry Kopp at a conference in the UK, it must have been, must have been tw uh, 2004 for, for a D-Day anniversary, making right, a very, right. force, make very forceful point about that. And there was a guy called um, Sidney Jarry who uh, wrote a marvellous book called 18 Platoon. He was a platoon commander in uh, um, 4th Somerset's at okay, Somerset right. in, in, in 43rd Division. So he wasn't at D-Day, but he had a very tough war thereafter. Book 8, 18 Platoon, one of the best first-hand accounts of an infantry officer in Normandy I've read. Anyway, but I, I, I got to know him quite well, actually. He used to come and talk at Sandhurst, where, where I taught. Right, right, right. And I remember him saying on one occasion that, you know, I hear about the Germans being better than the British. All I know is every time they came up against them, we beat them. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination of air power and artillery and all the rest of it. But actually... I think British and Canadian infantry was pretty good as well. Artillery was pretty good as well. Yeah. So I think you know the whole German worship can be taken too far. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, we've got gunners watching. They'll, they'll like to hear that, uh, <laughs> that the artillery was done. And it was. I mean, Mark Miller's book, again, I mean, I love that book too. It just it just explains so many things so many well, so well in such an oh. easily digestible way, I think. That's why it's so impactful. Um, I mean, I, 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 artillery is is the the key weapon for the Anglo-Canadian forces in Normandy. Simple as that. Yep, yep. Don't yep. get the artillery right; nothing else works. Yeah, because it, it works. But I mean, yeah, I think you maybe this is a good way to start winding down because it's been about an hour. Uh, is and I think why your work is another important way to look at this because you mentioned yeah you mentioned the Psalm you mentioned Passchendaele right that that still sets off people in Canada and everyone knows what that means. They might not understand it fully, but they know what it means. Anyway, so I think what you're doing is good because you're looking at this context of why this is happening. Every way that we've talked about today is building in that way. So it's it, it's it's a really interesting way to think about it and why this whole German mindset that's tainted by the Cold War and trying to beat the Soviets for a war that never happens is so, so I'm just saying outright bad for our understanding of these things. And it is so it misplaces it a lot. And I think what you're doing is a good way to do that and really think about it in a way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think I think you're right. Like, it's just, it's this progression and you have to learn these lessons one way or the other. And a lot of them are learned in blood, which is yeah. unfortunate. But that is the way um, these things go at times, unfortunately. Well, any, 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 more, any more questions? We've got a few, few yeah. minutes. Actually, yeah, we'll do a few more minutes. Uh, one, and I don't expect you to have an answer, but again, I'm not saying this in a mean way. You're just you're, you're older than I am. I wasn't even alive when this war happened. <laughs> you were. Is there was a question about the Falklands? Ah, I was. Yeah. I was doing. My, I was doing my final exams as an undergraduate during the Falklands, which which certainly dates me. Yeah, well, I was uh, minus six years old at that point. Um, <laughs> anyway, it was about how did tactics had changed. If that's something you would even have any way of. Oh, well, I'll tell you a little, a little bit about it. Um, well, during, during the Falklands War, or rather when the troops were going down, the uh, 3 Commando Brigade was going down to, to the South Atlantic, yeah. there there was a lot of, 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 uh, of, of reading of what had happened in the past, certainly uh, Gallipoli and, and, and D-Day. Uh, right. Certainly people were reading and sort of trying to draw lessons. Of course, one of the big differences was that, that uh, 3 Commando Brigade was... Britain's still is Britain's specialist amphibious formation. Okay, and so it was their their job to think about this sort of stuff, which certainly was not true at Gallipoli, for example. Right, right. Um, but they had two 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 parachute regiment battalions attached, which you know were not that that yeah, that was not, not 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 their, their, their thing. Um, but you know, I think you saw many many of the same things uh, playing out. Uh, you have had you know diversionary operations. The struggle to maintain, I mean, it didn't get anything, it didn't get air, 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 air superiority or anything like that, but at least air, air parity. Um, okay. And um, Julian Thompson, the commander of three commando brigades, has actually written very interestingly on, on this various various times. Um, I think maybe it was Julian said, you know, he very much had 
uh, Gallipoli in the back of his mind, you know, get on the beach, get off again as uh, as, as quickly as you can. I think the, the Falklands, obviously, it's very different from D-Day. It's very different from Dieppe, very different from, from Gallipoli. But nonetheless, mm. the, all of these things were influential in that it had contributed to thinking about amphibious warfare. And it, they were certainly very much in the minds of the commanders as they as they went down to, to, to the South Atlantic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't I don't know too too much about the, the Falklands conflict. Again, I wasn't born yet and it doesn't come up in my work that much. Uh, but it's 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 an interesting way, I think, again, to think about this in terms of the development. But you mentioning that a commander is thinking about the Gallipoli to me is is so interesting because you see that in other conflicts as well, right? The the Canadians fighting in Normandy can't not think about what happens in the First World War, right? Their their fathers and uncles mm -hmm. and neighbors had fought at Passchendaele or on the Somme or Vimy or what have you. So I think it's 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 a good way to think about this too and keeping these things in mind that there's connections, whether people think there are or not, because sometimes someone will think about it and then good or bad, whatever that would be, or we'll forget about it. I think that's worse, to be honest. Well, we, we, need, we need to have a sense of, of the way in which time telescopes mm. because uh, I'm hopeless at maths, but... Uh, <laughs> Passion in 1917. How many years is there between 1917 and 1944? What, 20-something? 20 20-something, 20 yeah. Okay. Think back 20-something years. Yeah. Well, so, someone in my generation, it's yesterday. The yeah. 1990s was yesterday. I can't believe I've got a 31-year-old daughter, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, it's very close. So the soldiers of the Second World War, um, their uncles, their elder brothers even, their fathers, mm -hmm. fought in the First World War, they know about this stuff at one remove, um, now they don't necessarily sort of swallow up all of the, you know, every, you know, lies there by donkeys. Everyone was doomed. Approach. I mean, so yeah, yeah. You know, this, this isn't true. But they are aware of this. Spike Milligan. Does, does that name mean, mean anything in Canada? Canada, great British comedian and writer. Not really, Not really unfortunately. But I oh, know but most people don't. Yeah, I know. We have our own thing going on over here. We, we're doing our best. <laughs> I mentioned Spike Milligan in Australia once, and everybody of a certain generation knew exactly who I meant. But Spike, no. Spike Milligan, a very famous British British writer, comedian, um, published his war diaries uh, from the 70s onwards, I guess. He served in the Royal, Art Royal Artillery in, in Tunisia and, and Italy. Mm -hmm. And in one of, one, one of his um, diaries, he says something like, you know, he's, at, he's actually, he gets combat exhaustion, shell shock in the First World War context. And he says something like, you know, if I had been in the First World War, I would have been shot like some of these other poor, poor buggers were. Um, now, that's something that's part of his heritage, his, you know, mm. his, 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 his learning. People just know about this stuff because it happened so, so recently. Right. And so one of the reasons for me doing the book, uh, actually, the, the, the book I'm working on, is we have lost this sense of the two world wars being very closely connected, I think. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 I won't go as far as to say that it's one war with, a, you know, a sort of 20 year truce in between. Mm. But actually, right. in terms of, of armies, it makes it, it makes sense to treat it as being one continuous process, or at least so the army of the Second World War is very conscious of the First World War. Yes. Partly, they don't, they don't want to make the same mistakes. They want, they, they, they want to learn lessons. They forget some of the lessons, but nonetheless, what I described in one of my pieces, the shadow of the Somme, is looming over the British and Canadian armies throughout the First World War. Through, sorry, throughout the Second World War. Yep, I completely agree. I mean, and this can be kind of like a wrap up, I guess, but I, I completely agree with you. And I think when you told me about this, again, because you reached out, told me about this book, I'm like, yes, let's do this. I don't care how much you, if you've got nothing down on the page, we can still talk about this. But I think you're right, because it's not one conflict, but the influence you can't ignore, but also the personnel. I think it's simplistic, but it's true. Like you cannot ignore these people. I mean, Andy McNaughton is a big commander in both wars. He's right. there. I mean, Criar is wounded at second Eep. Like he's, these people are literally experiencing these events and then they're ones in charge. Like, and then you have veterans from both wars. Like it's just, to me, it's it's a mistake to not think of these things in combination. Yes, don't you don't have to think about them as one war with yeah, like you said, the, the famous quote was uh, this isn't a peace, this is an armistice, blah blah blah, all that stuff. It's there's different contexts to leading to the Second World War, obviously. But I, in terms of again, doctrine and or well, what they call organizational learning in the business sense is something that cannot be avoided. So I think it's 
it's a great way to do this, and I'm really excited for when this book comes out. Is there a timeline for publication? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm about to, I'm instantly going to regret what I'm about, about to say. <laughs> I, I, I hope to get the manuscripts of publisher by this time next year. That, that That's what I'm planning to do. I've, I've written about half of it, I guess. Uh, it's quite chunky stuff to do. Stuff to do. I think I'm, I'm moving yeah. from amphibious landings to, to, to desert war next. <laughs> Uh, oh, still, a, lot, a lot of comparisons between the two world wars there. So there's still quite a lot to do, but actually I've got the wind in my sails and um, I've, been, I've been very pleased the way this amphibious chapter has, uh, has, 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 has come together. And actually, I've, I've, I've learned a huge amount through doing it. You know, I, I came into it with, with a few ideas, um, but as I've done the research, as I've done, as I've, I've done the reading around the subject, um, I, you know... <sighs> My, my 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 ideas have changed. I now think there's there's a much, I mean Dieppe is a, is the best example. I think that uh, I I always thought it was a, I thought it was a silly idea to start with. I now think it's a silly idea which should have been avoided had they only read their their own history books, their own doctrine, and gone back to Gallipoli. You know, it should never have happened in the way that it did. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to end. I think that uh, that's a really good way to say that, and I agree. And it's. Uh, I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's a bit off, but uh, that goes by in a blink as we all have learned in the last little while how fast time goes by. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I'm definitely looking forward to it. Maybe we can have you back on uh, when it's out and we can talk about it oh, generally. Yeah, I'd be and, delighted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be great to, to talk again. So uh, I'm just going to get it to start. I'll, I'll just put it on me, me, you real quick. I'll say something to the audience and then we'll uh, finish up. So thanks everyone for watching. Thanks for sticking around a little bit over the hour. Really appreciate everyone watching. Um, this was a great show. I hope you enjoyed it and the, the topic and talking about uh, a very specific thing in a broad sense. I uh, really enjoy it. So if you like what I'm doing on the channel, uh, please subscribe. It really helps me. The more I have, the better I do. Um, also, if you want to support the channel in other ways, there's a link to Patreon. You get lots of benefits and more stuff will be coming from that. Uh, and then if you just want to make a small donation through Buy Me a Coffee, you can do that as well. All the links are down below. And there's a bunch of videos that I linked about amphibious operations uh, from the Second World War, DF, uh, the landings in Italy, and Normandy down below if you want to, on the channel, if you want to check those out. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, hit the like and subscribe. That would really help me out. Uh, and another one coming up, I'm, hope, I'm not sure when I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do a review of, I've talked about this book before online, but Failure to Return, I really enjoyed it. it. It's a bit different, but it's really good. So I'll be doing a review of that on the live stream, maybe the end of the week. I'm not sure. I got to think about that, but I'll get that together real quick. And then I'll let everybody know. So thanks again for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, it means a lot to me. So everyone have a good day and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much.